Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, it's something I've wanted to do for a very long while, and that's bring you a Batman story. When I was in high school, a book of Batman stories came out called The Further Adventures of Batman – 14 All-New Adventures of the Caped Crusader. It was filled with short stories by several different authors. It was different than anything else I had read from the Dark Knight's exploits, because this wasn't a comic book. There were no pictures, just story after story. Somehow it kept my interest, and I remembered it today from back in 1989 when I read it for the first time. The year it came out. The first story was the one I remembered best, so it's the one I bring you tonight. It's called Death of the Dream Master by Robert Sheckley. I've linked to the book it's from in the episode description. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, Hear other podcasts that I host. Listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Bruce Wayne would never forget the scene. He saw it again in his mind's eye. The grisly windmill in the low fen country outside New Charity Parish. Bruce himself, as Batman, was there. He was spread-eagled against a wide wooden door, his arms and legs pinioned by steel clamps secured with half-inch bolts. The bodies of the Joker's most recent victims had been stacked roughly against a wall, like so much blood-stained cordwood. The torsos were in one pile, the arms and legs in another, the heads in a third. The Joker himself, his thin-lipped grin wider and more hideous than ever, his painter's smock stiff with blood, a blood-stained beret perched on his green-haired head, had just lifted up the last of his victims, little Monica Elroy. The child was still alive, but she had fainted. The Joker tried to slap her into consciousness because death was so much nicer when the victim was awake to appreciate it. Mercifully for her, the child did not respond. Well, she's being a poor sport about it, the Joker said. Might as well finish her and get to you, Batman. The Joker carried the child to the center of the big high-ceilinged room. It was dominated by two enormous grindstones, set on axles contained within an open scaffolding. The great wheels turned slowly, propelled by the wide wings of the windmill outside. They were bloodstained, those wheels. The blood from the victims they had ground into a paste of flesh and bone that stained the granite deeply. We'll just feed her in one toe at a time, the Joker said. Maybe she'll come around in time to say bye-bye. <laughs> Batman had been tugging at the clamp that held his right arm to the door. It had a fraction of give to it. Not much, but maybe enough. Enough to give him a chance, faint though it was. In past years, Batman had learned a precise control of muscles and nerves in his advanced studies in Tibet. He remembered those studies now and forced his concentration to narrow and deepen, ignoring the scenes of horror around him and the overwhelming smell of blood. All his energy had to go into that arm, into his wrist into the exact 
point of contact where the clamp pressed. He directed his force outward in a rhythmic fashion, timing it with his pulse beats, and, as he saw the Joker, unconscious child in his arms, mounting the three steps to the platform where the great grindstones touched their rough faces together, Batman drove at the clamp with every ounce of mental and physical energy at his disposal. For a moment, nothing happened. And then the steel clamp wrenched free from the wooden door with a loud, clear ringing sound, and the bolt that had secured it blew across the room as if it had been shot from a slingshot. The Joker, who had just been lowering the unconscious girl toward the grindstones, was hit on the back of the head. Although the blow did not hurt him, he started violently more shock than pain, and the girl fell from his arms. Off balance, he flailed, trying to regain his footing. One hand, wildly gesticulating in its blood-stained white glove, came up against the grindstones at their point of contact. The hand was pulled in at once. The Joker howled and tried to pull free. The grindstones turned inexorably. The madman screamed and wrenched at his arm, and so violent was his movement that it seemed as if the limb might be pulled from his shoulder. But no such luck. The grindstones continued to devour him and as his forearm vanished between the stones and the rest of him was pulled in after it, the Joker, mad with pain, began to laugh. The high, inhuman laughter of absolute insanity. And he continued to laugh as his body was pulled between the grindstone wheels, only stopping when his head came apart like a watermelon in a hydraulic press. And so the Joker was dead. But was he? If so, who was that madcap and horrifying creature that Bruce kept glimpsing at the corners of his vision? Who was Bruce Wayne seeing now as he walked through downtown Gotham City on his way to see his old friend Dr. Edwin Waltham? Bruce Wayne shuddered slightly and resisted the urge to turn. The figure was never there when he turned around but he kept on seeing it. This time, however, was different. He was at the corner of Fifth and Concord in the heart of Gotham City. Across the street rose the tall tower with the famous polychrome facade that was the New Era Hotel. It was the newest and most sumptuous hotel in the city, built, it was said, by a consortium of foreign investors. It was a place where the rich from all over the world came to look and to be seen, the women to parade in their furs and silks, the men to blow smoke from their fine Havana cigars. As he stood on the corner across from the hotel, waiting for the light to change, he clearly saw the figure he had glimpsed earlier. The man was long and skinny, dressed in a bottle-green swallow-tailed coat and tattersall trousers like an Edwardian dandy. But that was not what caught Bruce Wayne's eye. It was the man's hair mossy green above a narrow, long-nosed, long-chinned face. The face looked at Wayne for a split second, the long, red, thin-lipped mouth stretched into a grin. There could be no doubt about it. It was the Joker. But that was impossible. The Joker was dead. Bruce had seen him die himself, had even had a hand in it. The Joker, or his look-alike, turned away abruptly darted across the street and went into the New Era Hotel. Bruce Wayne came to an immediate decision. He darted out into the street, cars screeched and slewed out of his way. Picking his way across the wide boulevard like a fleet, broken field runner, Wayne made it to the curb, pushed with unaccustomed brusqueness past a group of gabbling society women and entered the lobby. It was like stepping into another world. Outside was the modern-day rush and squalor of Gotham City. Inside, his feet sank into the deep-piled Ispani rug made especially for the new era. Overhead, the central vault of the ceiling arched upward. Chandeliers, suspended from slender stainless steel threads, glittered with cut glass and blazed with light. The tall windows of the lobby were made of stained glass, giving the place a resemblance to a church for the worship of success. Surveying the scene, Bruce noticed many men in long, flowing Arab robes and headdresses. 
Some of the women were attired in the heavy veils of those where a form of purda is still practiced. Scattered here and there were bellboys, smart in their cold stream guards uniforms. Nowhere was there anyone who bore the least resemblance to the grinning figure Bruce had seen only seconds ago. Bruce hesitated a moment, then went up to the front desk. An assistant manager, a large, dignified-looking man in full evening dress with mutton chop sideburns and a bald, gleaming skull, asked if he could be of service. Bruce described the man he sought. The assistant manager pursed his lips in an imitation of thoughtfulness. No such person of that description has entered here, sir. Not now or ever. He might have sneaked in without being noticed, Bruce suggested. Oh, I think not, sir, the assistant manager said. He smiled a superlicious smile. A person of the description you gave us could hardly go unnoticed in a place like the New Era. Green hair and, and bottle green coat, you said? <laughs> no, sir, not in the New Era. Bruce felt like a fool. The man was eyeing him as though he were drunk or crazy. Bruce knew very well he was not drunk. As for crazy, well, that was one of the things he was going to Dr. Waltham to find out about. p.m. Dr. Waltham looked at his watch. Batman was late for his appointment. Waltham had been the Dark Knight's physician for many years. Never before had Batman been this late. Waltham was ready to close up. The physician went to draw the blinds. He heard a low laugh behind him and turned. "'Sorry I'm late,' Batman said. "'I ran into somebody I thought I knew. Hope you hadn't given up on me.' "'New problem, Batman.' Dr. Waltham said, peering at the tall, cloaked man with the black mask. As usual, Batman appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Waltham had come to expect it, as well as you can expect the unexpected. Uh, anybody I know? No longer. Uh, beg pardon? Nothing, Doc. Shall we get on with the examination? It was the time for Bruce Wayne's yearly physical. In his role as Batman, he required absolute physical conditioning of himself. He worked to his own exercise program and spent hours each week honing his skills in the martial arts. Although he was always in perfect condition, he knew that ailments and conditions could sneak up on you. Hence this yearly physical with his old family friend, Edwin Waltham, one of the top physicians in Gotham City. Waltham was an independently wealthy man who maintained his office and apartment on Starcross Boulevard, one of the best locations in the city. Waltham was small and corpulent, with a head of curly gray hair, a face flushed from good living, and small, alert eyes that behind round glasses glinted with intelligence. Clever though he was, however, it had never occurred to him that his old friend Batman was the same person as his father's friend, Bruce Wayne. You're in great shape, Batman, as usual, Waltham said at the conclusion of the examination as Batman adjusted his tunic. You've got a heart like a steam locomotive. You'd have to for some of the things you do. Batman nodded, frowning slightly. Waltham, who had been his parents' physician, was like most of the people in Gotham City and knew him only as Batman, scourge of criminals and of evildoers everywhere. The doctor was always eager to hear about Batman's cases. There was no harm in it, but there was no need for it either. Bruce Wayne handled the Batman portion of his life like a state secret. As he expected, Waltham asked, "'Are you working on anything now, Batman?' "'No, I'm still taking it easy. I haven't seen you with Vera recently.' He was referring to Vera St. Clair, a pretty society woman whom Batman had been seen with. She's in Rio, for the carnival. Lucky her! You should have gone yourself, Batman. I considered it. Batman didn't know how to tell it to Waltham, but a sort of lethargy had invaded his senses in the last few months. 
It had begun about the time he began having the hallucinations. He didn't want to talk about that, but it was one of the reasons he had come to see the doctor. Seeing him hesitate, Waltham asked, "'What is it, Batman?' Batman decided to take the plunge. "'Doc, I've begun seeing things.' The doctor maintained his professional aplomb, but concern glinted from his eyes. Hmm, tell me about it. The tall, grim-faced, masked man described his recent hallucinations. He had had them three times now in as many months. They were usually fleeting, no more than a glimpse of some old enemy from the past, now long defeated and safely buried. Most recently it had been the Joker, dead but Bruce had seen him entering the lobby of the New Era Hotel. Dr. Waltham considered his words carefully. Batman, I've given you the best physical money can buy. There's nothing wrong with you, physically. But mentally? I would almost stake my life on your being the sanest man I know. Almost? It's just a way of speaking. Have you had any unusual concerns on your mind recently? Batman shook his head. He couldn't tell Waltham that he'd been thinking a lot about the past recently, about friends he had once known, now dead, Robin, Batwoman, Batgirl, and dead enemies too, the Joker, the Riddler, the Penguin. All of them, friends and foes alike, were his family, those who shared his deeds back when the world was younger. He was older now, still perfectly fit, a unique physical specimen but older. No, no particular concerns. Waltham took off his glasses and wiped them carefully. Before putting them back on, he looked at Batman, his eyes a soft, unfocused, myomic blue. Tell me about the most recent. On my way here, I thought I saw the Joker. Somebody in the crowd, perhaps? A superficial resemblance? No, it was him. I followed him into the New Era Hotel but he wasn't there. The manager said that no such person had entered. A few hallucinations don't matter much, Dr. Waltham said. You've been through some of the most difficult and terrible experiences known to man. A little psychomotor activity would not be unexpected. Uh, but tell me, is there any chance the Joker is still alive? None whatsoever. I don't know the details of his demise, but I would remind you that the Joker escaped from many situations where death seemed certain. Why not this time? I'm sure he's dead, he said. Well then, I don't know how to advise you, Dr. Waltham said. The best thing would be for you to go down to Rio and join Vera. You need to get away, take your mind off these concerns. Thanks for the advice. Batman said. I'll think about it. "'Some tea, sir?' asked Alfred Pennyworth, Bruce Wayne's butler. "'It's the perfect Darjeeling that you like so well.' <sighs> "'Not right now,' Bruce said. He'd been going over crime reports at the antique table that served him as a desk." There were priceless antiques throughout the big, gracious old mansion that was situated on a landscaped knoll within view of Gotham City. "'Is there anything else I can do for you, sir, before I retire?' Alfred asked. "'As a matter of fact, there is,' Bruce said. He'd been brooding all evening about the events of the day and his visit to Dr. Waltham. Now he had decided to do something. Uh, "'I want you to pack a suitcase for me, immediately.' "'Certainly, sir,' Alfred said and his grave expression brightened. I'll pack your lightweight shorts, sir, and your new tropical suits. Perhaps a mask and snorkel? They say there's good underwater swimming there. I beg your pardon, Alfred. In Rio de Janeiro, sir, I assume that is your destination. To join Miss Vera for the carnival, and if you'll excuse my saying so, it's just what you need, sir. A change and a little amusement in your life— You've been rather on the gloomy side of late, sir, if you'll permit the observation. Bruce smiled. I'm touched by your concern, Alfred, but I'm afraid you've jumped to an erroneous conclusion. I will need no carnival costume where I'm going. I apologize for my incorrect assumption, sir. Might I ask where you're going? The New Era Hotel, 
here in Gotham City. Indeed, sir. Alfred's aplomb was unshakable. Bruce could have told him he was going to the North Pole, and the faithful servant would merely have inquired if he should pack ice skates. I'll need about half a dozen evening suits and some casual clothing for daytime wear, and the usual shirts and socks. A wardrobe such as you describe is already packed and ready to go, Master Wayne. I packed the Charlie Morrison wardrobe for you, sir. Alfred, you anticipate well. Yes, sir. One thing I didn't know, sir. Will you require the uh, overnight suit? Bruce looked up sharply. Somehow he hadn't considered taking the Batman suit. He hadn't quite brought himself to the point of considering that there were at least two interpretations of his hallucinations. One, that he was going crazy. Two, that someone was planning something clever and criminal and was trying to put a scare into him. Yes, pack the Batman suit, Bruce said, and put it in the small leather bag marked Ops 12, and one of the standard utility belts. At once, sir, said Alfred. He didn't bother to mention that he had also packed those things in expectation of just such a trip. You don't stay Batman's Batman for long if you can't anticipate his needs. Despite all the advantages of his Batman persona, there were a few disadvantages, too. For surprising hoodlums and criminals, the shock value of Batman was great, but for everyday use, it was too noticeable. When it was necessary for him to go somewhere, it was often an advantage to go looking like an ordinary citizen. But there were problems to going as Bruce Wayne, and then suddenly appearing later as Batman. Someone might find it a little more than coincidence that Bruce was around whenever Batman appeared. Because of this, Bruce had adopted several other personas to be used when occasions demanded it. The most recent of these, whom he called Charlie Morrison, had been invaluable when Bruce had gone to Europe to detect and foil a counterfeiting ring operation in several cities of Northern Europe. Bruce remembered how Commissioner Gordon himself had congratulated him at the end of the case when they met in the mayor's office in Hamburg. Gordon might have suspected that Charlie Morrison was Batman, but that was all right. He was supposed to think that. It helped keep suspicion off Bruce Wayne, the progenitor of both personas. Working with Lafayette Boyant, one of the masters of classical drama, Bruce had mastered makeup, posture, and voice. His impersonations could have earned him a place in the theater if the direction of his life had not been decided long ago. When Charlie Morrison checked into the New Era Hotel, the assistant manager helped him sign in with no hint of remembering his earlier visit as Bruce Wayne. The assistant manager was cheerful and helpful. Charlie Morrison was a man whose sapphire and ruby American Express card allowed him luxuries unknown to the ordinary citizen. Even among the crowds of visiting oil sheiks and heads of industrial parks, he was a welcome guest, tall, good-looking, quiet-mannered, and renowned for his liberal tips. The assistant manager brushed back his mutton-chop whiskers, a habitual gesture, and swiftly plucked out of a nearby tray a shimmering plastic oblong slightly larger than a credit card. He held it out to Bruce. Your suite in Penthouse A2, Mr. Morrison. It's one of our choicest suites, and I'm sure you'll find it eminently satisfactory. This card will give you entry to all the new era's facilities the health club, the restaurants and nightclubs, the solarium, the flying room, and so on. There is a complete list of our services in your suite. My name is Blythely. It is my ambition to serve you. If there is any complaint at all, please do not hesitate to call me day or night. Bruce thanked blithely, picked up his key, and went to the elevators. There was a special elevator for the penthouse suites. His luggage had already gone up. He pressed the button and stepped in when the heavy, ornate brass door opened. Just as the door was about to close, a woman slipped in with him. She was tall, sleek, and attractive, wearing a frock whose simplicity accentuated rather than belied its price tag. Her dark hair was tied back with a simple ribbon. She carried a small, richly brocaded purse that must have cost plenty, even in Hencheng, China, which Bruce remembered as the home of these objects. Yes, she said, following his gaze. It's Hencheng, do you like it? Bruce shrugged. It is quite attractive. She looked at him boldly. He didn't like the intensity of her inspection. 
Yet there was something exciting about her, something forward yet subtle and unashamedly feminine. You are also in one of the penthouses, she asked. Yes, and you? Of course, I always stay here when I'm in Gotham City. He had detected her faint foreign accent, but what was it? Not German, something farther east. Czechoslovakia, perhaps? The old penthouse day Vaughn has become something of a home for me. Do you stay here often? My first time, Bruce said. You will like it here very much, she said, as the elevator came to a soft stop and the door slid open. They walked together down the corridor. Penthouses A1 and A2 were opposite each other, the only apartments on the floor. They opened their doors with their cards. Uh, by the way, Bruce said, I'm Charlie Morrison. Perhaps we will meet again, she said. I am Aluna. She closed the door softly behind her. Bruce's clothes were already laid out by the hotel staff, all except the one large leather case to which he kept the only key. In it was the Batman equipment he might soon need, if his instincts were to be trusted. The suite was indeed beautiful, with a breathtaking terrace view of Gotham City. The city looked magnificent at this hour, a sleeping giant composed of the bodies and minds of its millions of inhabitants. Was one of those inhabitants the Joker? Impossible, yet he had seen something. Or had he? He sighed and turned away from the terrace. The living room of his suite was furnished with rare antiques from Eastern Europe and the Near East. There were Turkish wall hangings on one wall, a Picasso on another. A quick inspection told Bruce that the Picasso was genuine, worth perhaps several million dollars. The television was state-of-the-art. The DVD player came with a complete library and a catalog of others that could be called up on a moment's notice. The music console was also impressive. These things meant little to Bruce, however. This was the same sort of equipment he had at home. He knew from personal experience how difficult it is for the rich to buy anything really special. He sat in the Ames chair and leafed through a magazine. He was preoccupied, morose. What was he doing here? What could possibly happen in a place like this? The new era was one of the great bastions of safety with luxury. He was wasting his time. He called room service and ordered a light dinner, eggs poached with Normandy butter, toast points, slice of Paris ham, fruit cocktail, demi-tasse. He showered and shaved and dressed in a lightweight evening suit. He had just finished combing his hair when a discreet tap at the door told him the meal had come. The waiter wheeled the cart with its high silver-domed salver to the little table near the balcony. Bruce seated himself and opened the day's newspaper that the man had brought. The waiter deftly laid out the silverware, then whisked the top of the salver and set the plate down in front of Bruce. He bowed, said, "'Anything else, sir, please call,' and started toward the door. Bruce folded his newspaper and looked down at the plate. His expression froze. There, on the fine spode china, was a mass of writhing snakes, little green ones and a few red ones. Among them were several small toads. They looked up balefully at Bruce with their evil pop eyes. Waiter! Bruce called out as the waiter was going through the door. Sir, what is the meaning of this? I beg your pardon, sir. Come here and tell me how you explain this. Dutifully enough, the man came back into the room. Bruce noticed now that the waiter was almost bald and that there were faint tattoo marks on his shining skull. What seems to be the trouble, sir? Just look here and explain it, Bruce said, indicating his place. Yes, sir, I'm looking, but I fail to see anything amiss. Bruce looked down. The snakes and toads were no longer there. What was on the plate now was what he had ordered, ham and eggs by any other name. It's the toast points, Bruce said, recovering quickly. They're soggy. They look all right to me, Mr. Morrison, the waiter said, bending down to peer at the golden brown triangles of bread. You can see the moisture shining on them, and those eggs are practically hard-boiled, not poached at all. Bruce glared at the waiter, daring him to dispute, but the waiter was not there for that. Yes, sir, of course, sir, he said, his tone of voice indicating that he thought Bruce was acting a little peculiar, but that he was prepared to humor him. I'll have the order replaced at once. 
He wheeled the cart out, closing the door quietly behind him. It didn't take long to replace his dinner, and this time it underwent no change. Bruce ate quickly. After he was through, he wheeled the cart into the corridor. As he turned to return to his room, he saw a figure vanish around the corner at the end of the long corridor. A familiar figure. Tall. Emaciated. With green hair and a crazy smile. It took Bruce Wayne only three strides to reach full sprinting speed as he raced after the figure of his old enemy. He was looking remarkably healthy for one who was well and truly dead. The corridor was empty. On this side of the hotel, there were no suites, no doors at all. The Joker, or whoever it was, had vanished into a blank wall. Bruce inspected the wall closely. Beneath a light fixture, he saw a thin, metal-lined slit. He slipped the card the hotel had given him into it. A panel in the corridor's wall slid back. Retrieving his card, Bruce went through the opening into the darkness within. The corridor led down a long slope. Bruce hurried down it, just faintly hearing the sound of distant footsteps ahead of him. In another twenty yards, the corridor branched. A faint swirling of dust in the left-hand branch told him which way to go. He plunged down a steepening incline. The corridor had at first been lit by fluorescent panels set into the ceiling. As Bruce proceeded, the corridor became dimmer. Some of the panels weren't working. The pitch was so great that he was having difficulty maintaining his balance. There was a blocked-up window ahead of him, dimly perceivable in the gloom. There was no place to go other than through that or back up the slope. Bruce picked up speed and rammed the window with his shoulder, crashing through it and tumbling into a brightly lit room beyond. The room was done entirely in white tile and was lit by overhead fluorescence. It was steamy and warm. As Bruce rolled to his feet, he noticed that there were many men in the room, some of them wearing shorts, some towels, a few nothing at all. There were machines scattered around the room. Bruce was familiar with them. They were exercise machines of the sort he had himself in his workout room. He was in the health club. If there had been any doubt, that doubt would have been cleared up immediately when a short, muscular man with a wrestler's build, wearing white slacks and a white t-shirt that read New Era Health Club Instructor, strode up to him in a belligerent manner and said, Say, look here, bub, what's the big idea trying to break in here through the ventilator system? Then he noticed the card in Bruce's hand. Oh, sorry, sir, didn't know you were a guest. Our clients usually come through the door. The instructor was starting to grin. Bruce reached out and took the man's biceps in his hand. It looked like a friendly gesture, and his grip tightened only slightly. But the instructor went pale, tried to pull free, saw it was no use, and turned to Bruce with a frightened look on his face. Did you, did you see someone just enter? Bruce asked. A very tall, thin man with green hair? Green hair? The instructor said, and seemed ready to laugh. A slight application of pressure to his biceps convinced him that it was not really a laughing matter. No, no sir, I didn't. Really, I'd tell you if I did. Bruce released the man. A quick glance around the room told him that nobody answering the Joker's description could possibly have come here. Bruce said, Give me a pair of swimming trunks, please. I think I'll have a dip before I go back up. Yes, sir, the instructor said. And which way will you be leaving, sir? Going by the ventilators again? No, Bruce said. They're only fast getting here. Bruce felt better after doing a hundred or so laps in his explosive Australian crawl. He returned to his suite. Mr. Blythely came to visit him a little later. Blythely wanted to know if there was anything the matter. By his expression, Bruce surmised that he really meant, is there anything the matter with you, sir? Bruce merely glared at him. Blythely explained that although it was not so posted, the management encouraged guests to stay out of the ventilation system. Bruce managed to hold his temper. Now was not the time for an outburst. 
When the manager had left, Bruce went to the balcony and looked out at the night for a long time. He could hear music from the suite next door and sounds of laughter and the clink of glasses. It sounded like someone was having a good time. He was starting to get the idea that something was going on in the New Era Hotel. So far, it seemed to be something done especially for him. It was much later in the night that the noise woke him up. He sat bolt upright, moving instantaneously from deep sleep to immediate alertness. What had it been? A muffled thud from the next suite. It must have been something thrown against the wall, thrown hard enough for the sound to penetrate the soundproofing. Bruce dressed quickly in the dark. He was utterly silent, listening, his senses at full alert. Then he heard a scream. It was from the suite next door. He hurried out the balcony. It was about a 15-foot jump to the balcony of the next suite. Bruce could do better than that in the standing broad jump, but that was under ideal conditions. Here he would have to crouch on the very edge of his balcony and push off without the benefit of being able to swing his arms, and he would also have to be careful not to let his feet slip on the beveled facing material. He leaped. His calculations were not amiss, no matter what else might be wrong with him. His fingers closed crisply around the rail of the next penthouse. He used his backflip to vault neatly over the railing. The terrace doors to the penthouse were open, but long, fluttering white curtains obscured his view within. He moved forward into the darkened room. He felt something soft under his foot and recoiled sharply. Then he had found the light switch and flooded the room with light. She had been beautiful in life, but death had taken something out of her. She lay with one arm thrown back, the other bent beneath her. Her eyes were open and she seemed to be smiling. This was remarkable in view of the fact that her throat had been cut. There was nothing to do there. The woman, sole occupant of the suite, was dead. The telephone line had been cut. Her brocade purse seemed to be missing, but Bruce had no time for a complete search, nor did he know what to look for. He went back to his own suite. There he made two calls, one to Commissioner James Gordon, the other to Assistant Manager Blythely, and then back to await further developments. Soon thereafter he received a telephone call from the Assistant Manager. Would Mr. Morrison come to the main office? Bruce was already dressed. He paused only to check his attire, then went down to the lobby. Although it was the small hours of the morning, there were still many people there milling around. Fun ran late in Gotham City. Blithely greeted him as suavely as before, but he had a curious expression on his round, rosy face as he looked at Bruce. Could it be pity? Also present in the office was Police Commissioner James Gordon, the tough cop had cooperated secretly with Batman on more than one occasion. Despite Gordon's skepticism, they often teamed up in their fight against crime. Hello, Morrison, James Gordon said. Been quite a while. Hamburg, about three years ago, Bruce said. Tell me what you saw tonight, Charlie, Gordon said. But you've seen it yourself by now. Never mind. Describe it for me, please. Bruce described the scene in the suite. Okay. Gordon said. Let's take a look. Bruce, Gordon, and Blithely took the penthouse elevator to the top floor. There was the same corridor, with Bruce's suite on one side, the other belonging to the woman who had ridden up in the elevator with him. Is this the place? Gordon asked, indicating the door through which the woman had passed. Of course it is, Bruce said. What's the problem? Blithely opened the door with his pass card. He entered and turned on the light. The first thing Bruce noticed when he went in was the smell of fresh paint. Under the strong overhead lights, he could see that the whole suite had been freshly painted. Before painting, it had been stripped of furniture. A pile of drop cloths was stacked in a corner. Aside from that, the room was empty. Gordon and Blithely waited while Bruce inspected the apartment. He checked out all the rooms. In none of them was there any trace of recent occupancy and even less was there evidence that a brutal murder had been committed less than half an hour ago. The two men waited while Bruce walked back to them. Bruce said, 
Gentlemen, my apologies. I, I seem to have been mistaken. Gordon gave him a curious look and sucked at his unlit pipe. In his own brown garbodyne suit and beige trench coat, he looked like a private investigator of the old days rather than police commissioner of Gotham City. The manager said, Are you feeling all right, sir? It was a very startling incident you described. I do not wish to pry, but are you perhaps under the influence of alcohol or some prohibited drug? Certainly not, Bruce said, his voice taking on a cutting edge. Do you want to make charges against me, Mr. Blithely? Heavens no, Blithely said. I'm only thinking of the reputation of the hotel. When a guest starts describing scenes of mayhem that have never taken place, well, it makes one fear ever so slightly for the safety of other guests. That, taken with the various other incidents. What are those? Gordon asked, interrupting sharply. Blithely described Bruce's first appearance at the hotel, when he was looking for a man with green hair, and then Bruce's unusual entry into the health club. Gordon nodded when Blithely was through. He took off his heavy, horn-rimmed glasses and cleaned them with a crumpled tissue. He put the glasses back on, then broke into a grin. "'Well, Charlie,' he said, "'you've won your bet.' He took a ten-dollar bill out of his pocket and handed it to Bruce. "'Thanks,' Bruce said, following Gordon's lead, nonchalantly pocketing the money. "'I don't understand,' Blithely said. "'I used to tell Mr. Morrison here he was too formal, too uptight. I said he was too well-mannered to start a commotion.' Charlie bet me ten bucks he could get the manager of the best hotel in town to call me and complain that he was crazy. <laughs> I never thought you'd go through with it, Charlie. Well, you annoyed me, Bruce said. So this has all been a practical joke? Blithely asked. Of course it has, Gordon said. Does Mr. Morrison look crazy to you? Not in the slightest, Blithely said. But there was still a shade of doubt in his voice. Thanks for being such a good sport about it, Bruce said. There'll be a nice bonus added to the bill for you, personally, for taking this in such good humor. Oh, Mr. Morrison, there's no need. But Bruce waved him away with a lordly gesture. When Blithely left, even he was chuckling at the joke. When they were alone, Bruce went to the bar and poured Gordon a shot of bourbon and accompanied it with branch water on the side. He poured himself a glass of Vichy. Both men sat down on one of the couches. Gordon sipped his burden. Damn good bourbon, Charlie, he said. They have only the best here, Bruce said. So I see. Charlie, what in the name of Sam Hill went on here? Nothing, apparently, Bruce said. You should have taken me in. I'm obviously round the bend. Gordon didn't reply until he had his pipe going. While Malador's fumes rose in the air, he said, Even if you were crazy, I'd never let on to a guy like that. Bruce nodded. Blithely is not a sympathetic type, is he? Gordon shook his head. I'd arrange to have you committed all by myself if that was what was needed. Charlie, are you crazy? Why ask me? Bruce said. How would I know? I've gotten to know you pretty well over the years, Gordon said. You and I were involved in one of the toughest cases of the century, Charlie. I lost my belief in organized religion a long time ago, and I think I've lost about half my faith in justice, too, but... One thing I still believe in is Batman. Gordon looked up from his drink. He saw that Charlie Morrison was smiling at him. What's so funny? You, police commissioner of Gotham City, and you don't even know a loony when you see one, but you know what, Jim? I'm just as bad. I don't believe for a moment I'm crazy. Tonight has proven it to me. How's that, Charlie? I've seen the Joker several times in recent months. Just quick little glimpses. Then he vanishes. It had me worried. I followed him into this hotel, or so I thought. I decided it would be worthwhile to check in myself and see what was going on. All these incidents all in one night convinced me that someone's trying to put something over on me. I don't know how or why, not yet, but I'm going to find out. Frankly, I'm glad you're doing this, Gordon said. We've been getting a lot of rumors recently. Nothing we can pin down, but stuff that keeps on popping up about something going down that's both criminal and political. Something involving important people, something involving the New Era Hotel. Interesting, Bruce said. Anything else? Nothing definite. Just a lot of ominous-sounding rumors. You always hear these 
crazy stories about new criminal combines from foreign countries. This time there just might be something to it. I'm going to see what turns up, Bruce said. I'm glad. The way I see it, we've got just one thing to worry about. What's that? Bruce asked. I know you're sane, and you know you're sane, but what if we're both wrong? Two days passed without incident. Charlie Morrison did all the things a wealthy young bachelor might do in a hotel like the New Era. He sampled all their nightclubs and watched the shows. He listened to the comedians and laughed as heartily as anyone else. He tasted the gourmet specialties in several exquisite restaurants. He drank sparingly and turned down the offers of drugs and women from the bellboys. Early on the evening of the third day, he saw her again. She stepped out of the New Era beauty parlor just as he was coming out of the magazine shop. It was her, unmistakably, Ilona, the woman he had ridden up with in the elevator and later seen murdered in her suite. She wore a dark silk dress and had a turquoise scarf knotted carelessly around her neck. "'Excuse me, Elona,' he said. But she ignored him and hurried through the lobby, going through a door marked private. Bruce followed. He was in a corridor that seemed to lead to the kitchen area. The lighting was bad, and there was deep dust on the floor. The new era's spick-and-span look did not extend to the offstage areas. Bruce decided he would not eat here anymore if this was a sample of their true housekeeping. He rounded a corner and there she was. Stop following me, she said. Just a couple of questions, Bruce said. Oh, well, if that's all. She smiled, then opened her purse and took out a cigarette. She found a small golden lighter in her purse. She flicked it once and a cloud of yellow gas sprayed into Bruce's face. She dropped the lighter and fled as soon as Bruce hit the floor. You can fool all the superheroes some of the time, but you can't fool any of them all of the time. Especially not Batman. Lacking Superman's invulnerability, Batman had to rely on cunning, foresight, and his preternaturally keen eyesight. He had seen at once that the object Alona took from her purse was no ordinary lighter. Her very air of unconcern gave her away. He guessed what it was, but did not let on that he knew. He was holding his breath when she sprayed him. He fell to the floor and was gratified to hear the tinkle of the little gas canister as she dropped it beside him. He got up and picked up the little metal case. It was cunningly fashioned, turned on a metal lathe with a jeweler's precision. The curves of its surfaces were deep and complex. All in all, it was one of the finest bits of machine work he had seen in a long time. And he was one to know. Bruce Wayne, Batman, had his own tool shop and his own metalworking equipment. He knew good work when he saw it. Good work, yes, but whose work was it? He didn't know, but he had an idea where to go to find out. First, though, a change of attire. Might fell deep and dangerous on Gotham City. Darkness came down over the north side docks where sailors of a dozen nations traded with whores from half the continent. The gin mills of Gotham City were notorious from Montreal to Valparaiso. Recent defense contracts in Subias County adjoining Gotham City had brought many new people into the city. They came to work in the Subias County defense plants. At night, after finishing their shifts, they wanted some fun. They were not particular about how they got it. Fun tended to get rough in the more noisome parts of Gotham City, such as Limehouse. A man could get knocked on the head and rolled with little difficulty. If he was smart, he took his lumps and went away, a sadder but wiser man. If he tried to do something about it, he was due for an even more unpleasant surprise, such as waking up to find himself wearing lead-filled ski boots and sinking in the garbage-strewn waters of the Limehouse River in the company of eels and crabs. Limehouse was an old industrial slum, a dark and dangerous place. The more upright inhabitants had been trying to get the street lighting back on for a long time without success, 
because of a corrupt city administration that sold all the lighting fixtures to a Mexican entrepreneur. Darkness bred crime in the stews of the city. Darkness bred all creatures of the night, especially bats. It was close to midnight, and Limehouse was just coming into its fullest flower. The drunken and motley crowds of sailors parading the streets did not notice a shadow that passed briefly across the huge lemon moon before it dipped down to ground level and came to rest in one of the narrow backyards. Batman, in full uniform and mask, folded the small bat-winged batcopter and stowed it in his compact carrying case. With a small but powerful bat light, he briefly consulted a map of his own devising. It was a flat tablet about the size of a sheet of typing paper and less than an inch thick. Illuminated from beneath, it could be scrolled to reveal highly detailed maps of any part of Gotham City. Batman checked his coordinates again. Yes, he was in the right location. It had been almost two years since he had come to this particular address. He hoped that Tony Marotti was still in business. Orienting himself, Batman moved silently to the back door of the sagging one-story frame house nearby. He moved like a shadow. The full moon picked up the white glints of his eyes beneath the black mask. That was all that was visible as he jimmied the door and slipped inside. The house was divided into several rooms, just as he had remembered. He was in the rearmost, the storage room. Here, neatly laid out on greasy steel shelving, was a variety of metal tubing, cog wheels, nuts and bolts and steel bins, reels of electrical wire of various gauges, and many other things of similar nature. The door to the outer rooms was closed, but a yellow oblong of light shone from beneath it. Batman listened at the door. He could hear a radio softly playing jazz and the scrape of footsteps as a man moved around within. A few minutes listening convinced him that only one man was inside. Batman opened the door and stepped into the room. The man had been working at a small lathe. He looked up abruptly as Batman came through, his hand diving toward a rear pocket. Before he could draw the gun he kept there, Batman was across the room and had taken the weapon out of his hand. Not so fast, Marotti, he said. You don't want to plug your old friend Batman, do you? Sorry, Batman, Marotti said. Didn't know it was you. I went for the rod before looking to see who it was. Do you usually shoot first without looking to see who it is? When you come through my storage room after midnight, yeah. Well, you're very welcome here, Batman. Can I get you a drink? Not while I'm on duty, Batman said. But this is something special. My Uncle Lou, you remember him, don't you? Sent over this bottle of liquor from the old country. Try a shot with me for old time's sake. A sip, no more, Batman said. Marotti crossed the room and went to a cupboard. He took out a large, long-necked bottle with a florid Italian label on it. Marotti was a short man, bull-chested and thick-necked. His head was round and covered in crisp black curls. He had a wide, generous mouth and clever, shifty eyes. He walked with a noticeable limp, a souvenir of the time some years ago when Batman had managed to save him from a gang that had trapped him on a tenement roof near his pigeon coop and shot out his kneecap. "'Good to see you, Batman,' Marotti said. "'What you been up to? Hadn't seen any newspaper write-ups about you in quite a while.' Batman ignored that. How have you been keeping, Marotti? Pretty well, Batman, pretty well. Is crime still profitable? <laughs> oh, come on, yeah. You know I don't do that stuff no more. I know that you do, Batman said, but I'm not here about that. You're not big enough for me to go after. No insult intended. But I need to reserve my time for the really big ones. I know that, Marotti said, and I respect it. I need some information. Sure, Marotti said. Shoot. Uh, only kidding. I mean, what about? Batman took a pouch out of one of the pockets on his utility belt and opened it. He removed the small canister with which Alona had tried to gas him earlier and handed it to Marotti. Marotti looked at it and seemed about to ask a question. Then he changed his mind, fished a pair of granny glasses out of a greasy vest pocket, put them on, and studied the canister carefully. Where'd you get this? he asked. Never mind. Tell me who made it and who for. I thought this might have been your handiwork. Marotti shook his head. 
This is high-class machining. Takes better equipment than I got to do this. You see this beading? You need a zero-null drill press and whole line redactor to do that. I don't need that for my line of equipment. Can you identify it for me? Batman asked. Maybe. Mind if I cut it apart? Go ahead. Marotti limped across the room and adjusted the overhead floodlights so that he could get a good look at what he was doing. He set up the casing in a vise, then cut it apart with a diamond-toothed saw. He examined the interior of the two hemispheres, frowning, then looked at them again with a magnifying glass. After studying both carefully, he discarded one and turned his attention to the other. He gave a grunt when he found what he wanted. Look here, Batman. See this symbol? Batman peered through the magnifying glass and made out a tiny V with a crossbar stamped into the metal. That's a manufacturing symbol, Marotti said. Do you know whose it is? I've seen it somewhere, but I don't remember. But I must have it here somewhere. Marotti went to a sagging bookshelf and pulled down a thick book. Manufacturer's symbols, he explained. He leafed quickly through, his fingers going deftly to the right page. Here it is. What are the trademark symbols of ARDC? It stands for Armadillo Rex Development Corporation. It says here they're based in Ogdensville, Texas. The plant manager and chief stockholder is Rufus Red Murphy. Do you know anything about these people? Batman asked. Uh, ARDC designs and sells special arms. They specialize in exotics, as they are sometimes called in the trade. They turn out anything from miniature spy stuff to complete missile launch systems. Marotti took off his glasses and put them away in a worn case. Then he turned to Batman and said, What was in this canister? Some kind of tear gas? Batman shook his head. A gas, evidently designed to make a man sleep. Or possibly kill him. I didn't inhale it to find out. Very wise. Do you know anything about this? Marotti went to his jacket, hanging from a wooden peg on a wall, and fished out a cigarette. He fired up and said, There's been talk about new development in anti-personnel gases. In some compounds, they can uh, put a man out for like 24 hours without harming him, change the formula slightly, and you kill the man dead. All without telltale order, mind you. In another formulation, LSD extracts are used to make a hallucinatory gas designed to disorient an enemy. Interesting, Batman said. Is that of interest to the criminal element? You can bet on it. Can you think of a better way to stage a bank robbery? Get everybody tripping and seeing visions of horror while you walk away with the loot? <laughs> but nobody's got any of that stuff yet, otherwise you'd be hearing more about it. Batman could testify that someone, at least, had some of that gas but there was no need to tell Mariotti that. Bruce Wayne, disguised as Charlie Morrison, was at the Gotham City Municipal Airport at 9 o'clock the next morning. He was booked first class to Ogdensville, Texas, with only one brief stop in Atlanta. His two suitcases of equipment made him overweight, but he was able to get them on the same flight. There was no inspection for in-country luggage, but even if an inspector had looked into it, he would have seen cases of industrial samples. Only when they were assembled would they constitute the essential equipment Batman found useful on many of his cases. Atlanta was bright and steaming. Bruce had time for a coffee in the first-class lounge and a look at the newspaper. Then it was time to board again. Miraculously, the flight was nearly on time. The trip passed uneventfully. It was mid-afternoon, central time, when the big Boeing 747 put down at Staked Plains Airport serving Ogdensville and Amarillo. 
A telex sent earlier had alerted Finley Lopez, an investment consultant on energy and defense matters, with his main office in Houston. He was one of the foremost investment consultants in the Southwest and someone Bruce often worked with in his Morrison persona. Lopez had taken a local flight to Ogdensville and was at the airport to meet him. Oh, good to see you, Mr. Morrison. Finley Lopez was a large man, suave and easy-mannered, his complexion a light olive. He had a narrow black mustache and bright brown eyes with dark pouches under them. A small scar above his left eye was the last reminder of a tough childhood growing up in the barrios of Brownsville. You're looking well, Finley. Not letting the uh, senoritas take up all your time, are you?" Lopez grinned. His reputation as a ladies' man was known from Bayou City, Louisiana, clear west to Albuquerque. Not quite at all, Mr. Morrison. Business comes first, but I could show you one fine old time if you'd let me. Good of you to offer, Bruce said, but I'm afraid I'm here this time on business. So let's get it done. Then we can paint the town red. Or maybe you'd like a real old-style Texas barbecue at my ranch. My wife Esmeralda has a special way with beef ribs." "'I remember Esmeralda's cooking well,' Bruce said. Uh, "'Please, g give her my love, but I'm just here for the day. I return to Gotham City tonight.' "'Well, tarnation,' Lopez said with mock annoyance. "'Can't you have any fun at all? What can I do for you, Mr. Morrison?' "'I'm interested in the ARDC Corporation.' Lopez nodded. Good, solid output with a first-class reputation. Red Murphy is the chief ramrod on that spread, Mr. Morrison. You'd like him. He looks a little like Spencer Tracy, only not so pretty. I'd like to meet him today. Let's find a telephone, Lopez said. Lopez found a phone in the airport and called. He left the booth, shaking his head. I don't know what's getting into Murphy, he said. Must be getting old. What's the matter? Bruce asked. I spoke to his personal secretary. She said that Murphy isn't seeing anyone at the moment. For how long? She couldn't say, just that he was very occupied with important matters. Lopez scratched his chin, thinking, let me make another call. Ten minutes later, he had further news. I called Ben Braxton. I don't think you ever met him, Mr. Morrison. He's chief editor of the main newspaper here, the Ogdensville Bugle. I've done him a few favors in my time, and he was glad to fill me in on Murphy. It's all uh, public knowledge anyhow, but it saves us from having to dig it out of the newspaper's morgue. Seems that Murphy has been acting oddly for the past several weeks. He has a suite in the factory complex, you know, and he moved in there recently, him and his wife. Her name's uh, Lavinia. She's a fine woman, Mr. Morrison. So they're both living in the ARDC factory complex? That's right, and they haven't come out. They talk to family members by telephone from time to time, but they haven't been seeing anyone. Not even their son, Dennis, who was in town recently on his way to South America. He's a firefighting specialist and spends most of his time on the road, but Murphy wouldn't even see him. It's very curious." Curious indeed, Bruce said. Well, Finley, let's have some lunch. I'll just have time to catch the evening flight back to Gotham City. You're going to come up and go just like that? Come on, Mr. Morrison, why don't you tell me what this is all about? It isn't about anything, Bruce said. I've gotten some information about ARDC, and I was considering making a large investment in the company. I thought I'd talk to Murphy, see what I think of him, before tying up capital. But if it can't be done at this time, it'll keep. You got any place good to eat around here? Indeed we do, Lopez said. I hope you like barbecue, Mr. Morrison, because one of the finest restaurants in the state is just a few miles outside of town." The restaurant, Los Angelitos de Tejas, was a beautifully restored building in Spanish colonial style. They ate on the broad terrace, overlooking the formal gardens that the restaurant maintained at great expense. Bruce ate enough of the fiery and savory barbecue to satisfy his host. Bruce's own taste was more for diets high in fiber and nuts, with plenty of salad and vegetables on the side, but he didn't want to insult Lopez's native cuisine. Lopez drove him back to the airport and saw him aboard the 4 p.m. flight to Gotham City with a stopover in Kansas City. When the plane reached Kansas City, Bruce got off and booked a private plane to take him back to Ogdensville. He arrived just after dark. His luggage was still there, in the locker where he had left it.
The ARDC complex occupied several hundred square acres of flat desert close to Ogdensville. It was surrounded by a double barrier of electrified fence. Armed guards patrolled the perimeter at all hours. At night, the place looked uncanny with its guard towers spaced every hundred yards, the entire line of fence brilliantly illuminated by searchlights. It looked like a concentration camp in the American desert. Bruce Wayne, who had been Charlie Morrison, now became Batman, and Batman was not too impressed. In his line of work fighting some of the most ingenious and well-financed criminals the world has ever known, he had on many occasions had to get into places of strong security, places whose owners had gone to considerable expense and ingenuity to make Batman-proof. ARDC would not be easy, but it was a long way from impossible. Batman's first attempt was on the north side of the complex. Here, several of the floodlights had gone out, a sign of carelessness that might in itself mean something. Carrying a heavy suitcase of equipment with him, Batman observed the guard's routine for a while, blending perfectly into the night, and with the gift of total immobility when he so desired, Batman watched for almost two hours. He concluded that it would be difficult to get through the wire without someone noticing. The guard's paths meshed too well to allow even the ten minutes or so he would need to neutralize the electricity and get through the wire. He turned his attention to burrowing beneath. Taking a small but powerful mass detector from his suitcase, he took an underground profile of the surrounding land to a depth of a hundred feet. As he had feared, the ARDC security people had invested in an advanced sensing alarm system, which would detect movements in the earth to a depth of fifty feet. He would have to give up any thought of going under the wire. He would need earth-moving equipment if he wanted to get below the level of the detectors. He decided that this break-in might not be as easy as he'd expected. He stood in the darkness and thought for a while, a tall, awe-inspiring figure dressed in black from head to toe. Even the little peaked ears of his costume seemed to be standing stiff in concentration. At last, he made up his mind. He was risky but he had undergone worse. Billy Joe Naaman and Steve Kingston were on the northeast quadrant that night. Even in their dark blue guards' uniforms, they looked like what they were, out-of-work cowboys filling in the time between rodeos with any work they could find. Guarding the place for old man Murphy was not bad work. Murphy was a fair man, and he paid a decent wage. The only trouble with the job was it was boring. So highly evolved were the protective systems that surrounded the factory that no one ever tried to get in. Night after night, it was the same. The soft hiss of the desert wind, the occasional howl of a coyote, and nothing else. Ever. Except for tonight. Tonight was different. It began with a loud hissing sound that seemed to come from the desert. You ever heard anything like that? Billy Joe asked. Might be a gut shot bear, Steve said. I doubt it. Not this far south. They listened. The sound increased in intensity. Then a light appeared in the sky in front of them. It pulsed a bright, electric violet unlike anything either man had ever seen. You know, Billy Joe said, I don't like this one little bit. What's it up to now? Steve asked. The violet light had begun to move, traveling in easy swoops back and forth across the sky coming closer and closer to the perimeter fence. "'You like we should shoot it down?' Steve asked. He had already cleared his sidearm. "'Don't go getting nervous,' Billy Joe said. "'Ain't even nothing to shoot at yet. Let it get a little closer.' They watched as the brilliant, violent light advanced toward them. Billy Joe had picked up his submachine gun. He clicked off the safeties as the violet light came directly overhead. Then it burst into dazzling light like the simultaneous bursting of a million flashbulbs. At the same time, it gave off a deafening noise like a howitzer going off about five feet from them. Both men fell down, stunned and blinded. They got to their feet quickly, rubbing their eyes and trying to regain sight. There was a field telephone ringing nearby. It was from the Southern Quadrant guard post, several miles away on the other side of the perimeter fence. The guards there had picked up the noise and flash and wanted to know what was going on. Billy Joe pulled himself together enough to make a report. Cal, he said to the Southern Quadrant guard, I hate to tell you this because you're going you're gonna to call me a liar, but I think we just saw a UFO close up. 
My Aunt May saw one of those last year, Cal said. They are the dangerous things, aren't they? Cal, I'm telling you, that's what we that's what we saw in here, as we can tell. Oh, I believe you, Cal said. I guess we better go on full alert just in case you boys been hitting a bottle or chewing on devil weed. Four jeeps full of armed men roared out of the motor pool. They raced around the inner perimeter, helping out the jeep's headlights with handheld searchlights. They came across plenty of tumbleweed, but nothing else. Nothing they were able to spot, that is. Darkness and silence again. No sounds but the moaning desert wind and the occasional call of a coyote. No movement on the fenced-in land of the inner perimeter except for the wind, rippling the grass that the ARDC Corporation maintained at so high a cost. Grass rippling in the dark. Something flowing across the dark grass. Something dark, shapeless, large, moving in a zigzag fashion, coming closer and closer to the main buildings. In the high watchtower, Steve was watching the grass. There was something a little funny about it tonight. But that was the wind, blowing it back and forth in sudden flaws, taking unexpected turns and reversals, until you could almost swear there was someone or something moving through it. But that was crazy. Nothing could get through the fence. What are you looking at? Billy Joe remarked beside him. Just watching the grass, Steve said. Oh, buddy, Billy Joe said, we're paid to look outside the perimeter, not inside. We already know there's nothing inside. Nothing except us chickens, Steve said, grinning. Us chickens. And a very large bat. Promptly at midnight, the captain of the ARDC guards, Blaze Connell, a former Texas Ranger, reported to Red Murphy in his suite. Everything okay, Mr. Murphy? Thank you, Blaze. What was the bright flash a couple hours ago? Although Murphy's suite was deep within the ARDC complex and had no window to the outer world, Red Murphy had picked up the flash on one of the banks of TV monitors that were the eyes of the perimeter surveillance system. Couple of the boys think it was a flying saucer. Connell said, but that's crazy. I really don't know what it was, sir. Does the perimeter fence show any sign of breaching? Connell shook his head. Integrity intact. I guess we won't worry too much about it, Murphy said. Good night, Blaze. When his guard captain had departed, Red Murphy went to the sideboard and poured himself a drink. He'd been going to the bottle a little too much recently. He knew that, but he was under heavy stress. The worst of it was having to keep it all to himself, at least he could share it with his bottle, even if that was not such a great idea. The apartment was furnished plainly in a typical Western motif. Piebald cowhides covered the chairs. The couches and tables were simple but well-made. There were two original Remington oil paintings on the wall, the only touch of ostentation in the room. Aside from them, everything was plain and serviceable, even though the suite was larger than usual. Red Murphy was a man who didn't like to feel hemmed in. The Remingtons, with their sense of wide spaces and western subjects, helped him forget the reinforced concrete on all sides. He held the shot glass up to the light and squinted at it. He had a tough, square face, tanned to the color of saddle leather and seamed by many hours in the fierce sun and driving wind. Murphy was short and so big in the chest and shoulders that he looked almost misshapen, he had done all the oil field jobs, roustabout, gantry walker, puddler, valve wiper. For years his hobby had been riding around the scrub country west of Ogdensville in his battered old Land Rover. Folks thought he was a touch loco, spending all those hours just aimlessly riding around the desolate land. They thought he was crazy, for sure, when he put up every cent of his earnings to take out a drilling lease on the old double-O field. 
It had gone dry ten years before, and even though new deposits had been suspected in the area, not a drop had been taken out of it. Red Murphy got up the money to hire an oil rig. He surprised everybody by first bulldozing the shack and corals that had marked the headquarters building of the Double O Enterprise. Then he'd sunk his bits into a point not more than ten feet off the center of what had been the living room. The ensuing guster was a beauty. He'd found the basin. Just as his studies of the surrounding countryside, carried out during those so-called idle trips in the Land Rover, had predicted. The oil was there, in sufficient quantity to let him begin to build a fortune that was soon to be legendary, even in this country of big men with big bankrolls. When the bottom dropped out of the oil business in Texas, he anticipated it by almost six months. He got his money out and bought the ailing ARDC Corporation. ARDC had a list of bad debts as long as a polecat's shadow on Sadie Hawkins Day, as the wits at Bernigan's Saloon and Pool Hall in Ogdensville used to say. Its machinery was out of date and mostly falling apart, and its senior personnel had given up on the company long ago, keeping their jobs for the paychecks but looking around for something more interesting to switch into. Against all these liabilities, the company had only two assets – a potentially lucrative assortment of defense contracts, and a team of the country's best weapon systems engineers. Murphy thought he could parlay those into something interesting. He rebuilt the factory, replaced the worn-out machinery, fired the time servers, and gave wage increases and incentive bonuses to the ones he kept. When he hired new men, he hired the best. Soon, ARDC, under its dynamic new management, was turning out some of the best weapons systems in the world. Their small arms division attracted the attention of the British and French secret services, who were eager to buy some of the products, and the Department of Defense was very interested indeed, as were the police chiefs of America, who saw in ARDC one of their best hopes in the endless war against crime. Red Murphy was liked and respected in business groups all over the country. He was welcome in high circles in Washington, he used to attend Washington's special functions frequently. But for the past months, he'd not been seen in his usual haunts. He'd begun staying in the factory suite, talking to business associates, friends, and relatives by telephone. Only Blaze Connell, the security chief, saw him. People wondered about it, but eccentricity is part of the Texas tradition. As long as a man doesn't hurt people or walk around naked, he can act as weird as he pleases nobody's going to pay any attention. Practically nobody. Murphy finished his drink and quickly poured another. He held up the shot glass and looked at the room through its amber transparency. The room looked distorted. Murphy laughed and tossed down half the drink. Then he heard a sound behind him and stiffened. There was nothing there but the big double closet where he stored his hat collection and his golf clubs. Somebody in there, he said aloud. There was no reply. Murphy put down the shot glass. He reached to his back and took out from beneath his flowing Hawaiian shirt a chromed 44 Magnum automatic with rosewood handles. He cocked it and walked toward the closet. Come on out, he said. This is the only time I'll say it. No reply. He leveled the big gun and pulled the trigger. Slugs blasted apart the light wooden closet door. A pile of hats tumbled out, some of them ragged from being shot through the headbands. Murphy cursed softly when he saw what he had done. He was even angrier when he saw that he had put a slug through his Ben Hogan Memorial Classic set of woods. Damn nation, he said. Don't worry, a voice said behind him. You only punctured the bag. The sparse hair on Murphy's big skull lifted as he heard a voice from where no man could be. A tremor of fear swept over him. He forced himself to turn and wasn't surprised when the automatic was plucked out of his hand. His second shock came when he faced the owner of the voice. He was looking at a tall man dressed entirely in black and gray. A wide cloak with many points flowed from the man's broad shoulders. The man wore a cowl and a half mask. On top of the cowl-like covering, there were small pointed ears. Oh, Batman! Murphy cried, clutching at his chest. The pain had just hit him. The almost forgotten pain in his chest and neck that he used to get before the triple bypass the sudden attack brought on by the shock of seeing the legendary figure here, in the midst of his fortifications, 
the pain brought on by long anxiety and a guilty conscience. Murphy collapsed suddenly and wasn't aware that blue gaunted lid arms caught him before he hit the floor. Murphy's eyes fluttered, then opened wide. You still here? he asked. He was stretched out on the bed. His tie had been loosened and his shoes taken off. The tall figure of Batman stood near the bedside. Yes, I'm still here, Batman said. How are you feeling? Not bad for a man who didn't expect to open his eyes this side of the Jordan. What'd you do? I gave you an injection of hectomorphinate. It's one of the antidotes I carry in my utility belt. I couldn't be sure, but it seemed that you were having a heart attack. And what does this d d hecto whatever you call it do? It acts on the blood vessel walls, taking them out of the fatal spasms that presage death. My doctor never mentioned this stuff to me. He will. He will be coming on the market in the fall. Murphy sat up cautiously. I guess I don't have to ask who you are. I I've heard about you for years, but never thought I'd meet you. I did meet Superman once at a fundraising for crippled children in Washington. Seemed like a nice fella. Superman's okay, but I didn't come here to discuss superheroes with you. I, I, I didn't think so. Do you, do you think I, I can walk all right? No, don't help me. If I can't make it to the liquor cabinet myself, I'm washed up anyway. He moved in a slightly creaky fashion to the liquor cabinet and poured himself a double shot of bourbon. It steadied him so nicely that he immediately poured another. Hitting that stuff a little hard, aren't you? Batman said. So what are you? Murphy said belligerently. An advancement for the WCTU or something? Just a concerned bystander, Batman said. I need an explanation from you, Mr. Murphy. About what? This. Batman produced the two halves of the little hemisphere with which Ilona had tried to gas him. Murphy examined it. Yeah, that's our trademark. Where'd you get this? Somebody tried to use it on me. So? Is Colt responsible for every revolver that gets used on somebody? That's beside the point. I know you know something about this, because other weapons like this have been turning up. They've been traced to your factory. You can't prove a thing, Murphy said. Maybe I can't. Not yet. But I will. Go ahead and try, Murphy said. It put away half the shot, looking up startled when Batman slapped the glass out of his hand. Eh, what's your big idea? Get hold of yourself, Murphy. You've got quite a reputation in this country. People consider you a brilliant operator and a straight shooter. You've always had a reputation for being forthright, accessible. Now, suddenly you're hiding inside your own factory. You've got the place guarded like it was Hitler's hideout, and you're drinking heavily. You got troubles, Murphy. Something's turned your life around, and I want you to tell me about it. Why should I? Because you've got to tell somebody. Otherwise, you'll explode. And why not me? If you can't tell your troubles to a superhero, whom can you tell them to? Murphy stared at him, open-mouthed. And anyhow, Red, maybe I can help. I'd like to try. Murphy continued to stare at him. Suddenly, there were tears in his eyes. He said, When I was a kid, I loved the superheroes and wanted more, more than anything to be like them. Tarzan was the first for me, and then there were a lot after that. You were always special for me, Batman. I liked you because you were more human than most of them. For a while, I tried to be like you. <laughs> but funny, isn't it? You ought to get a good laugh out of this. I'm not laughing, and I don't look down on you. Talk to me, Red. Tell me what's going on. Murphy looked uncertain. I, I could get killed for talking to you. You're killing yourself by not talking to me. I guess that's so, Murphy said. Yes, I'm in trouble, Batman. It all started about a year ago. Murphy told about how a year ago, when ARDC went public for the first time, Tufel Corporation, a big Swiss-based corporation, made hidden purchases all over the world through designated nominees and acquired a controlling share of ARDC's outstanding stocks. Tufel had taken over ARDC, and they had the right to retire Red Murphy if they so desired. Murphy didn't figure out for a long time how it had happened. It all took place so rapidly that he was shocked and apathetic at a time when all his senses should have been on alert. 
the new owners never appeared. Operating behind a screen of lawyers, they proposed to allow Murphy to continue running ARDC. They even promised him a chance to buy back a majority interest in the stock, and so reacquire his own company. But first, for a while, he had to do things their way. Several of my people warned me about them, Murphy said. I should have listened, especially when they started screwing up the research and production divisions. But I thought that playing along would get me back in control faster. I figured that with their sloppy methods of inadequate quality control, they'd fail, you see. I didn't know then what they were really up to. He reached for the bourbon bottle. Batman pushed it gently out of his reach. Might as well give it up now, Red. You can't keep on hiding here forever and drinking. You'll never find a better chance to quit than now. Murphy looked at Batman and knew that the masked man spoke the truth. You don't get a superhero telling you to quit the booze every day. Murphy reached out and grabbed the bottle. He threw it against the wall as hard as he could. It made a satisfying sound as it shattered. Soon after this, his telephone rang. Murphy answered it. Blaze? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, that was me firing the 44 earlier and breaking the bottle now. I was having a little celebration. Yeah, sure, all by myself. Uh, me and my bats. The bats in my belfry, I mean. <laughs> sure, I'm fine. See you in the morning. He hung up the phone and said to Batman, Suppose I make us some coffee? We got a lot of talking to do and not much time to do it in. What do you mean? Batman asked. The Joint Chiefs are about to sign a contract with ARDC for a new computerized weapons system. What's so bad about that? Well, let's get that coffee in and I'll tell you. In the morning, Red Murphy surprised his staff by announcing that he was going to Lake Sarmatian, the man-made lake that had been created by the recent damming of the North Pecos River. He had his staff pack the new Carlino Gar Wood monohull, still in its packing case, onto the back of his heavy-duty pickup. The gates opened, and Murphy sped through, waving to his guards. Twenty miles down the road, there was a grove of cottonwood trees, used by the local high school and Bible college for barbecues and song fests. It was deserted now. Murphy negotiated the steep dirt road and pulled out of sight of the highway. He got out and went back, pry bar in hand, to open the packing case. Batman, who had been secreted within the packing case, had already worked his way out and was sitting under a tarpaulin, reading a plane schedule with a little pen light. A button too uncomfortable for you, Murphy said. I've been in worse. It was easier than breaking out of your factory again. What you want me to do now? Murphy asked. I'd like to leave you here for a while. I'll drive your truck to the airport alone and arrange to have somebody drive it back here. That's fine with me, Murphy said. Lucky I brought along a newspaper, but uh, why can't I drive you to the airport myself? When I reach the airport, Batman said, I'll have changed clothes and become someone else. And you don't want me to know who that someone else is. That's it. Please understand, it's not that I don't trust you, but it should be obvious that there's no sense being an anonymous figure if everybody knows who you are in real life. Makes sense, Murphy said. Sometimes the costume changes are more difficult to arrange than solving the case. <laughs> I can imagine, Murphy said. Here, Batman. He handed the masked man the car keys. Is there anything else I can do for you? Just a final point or two. You said that the Joint Chiefs are about to sign the contract with ARDC? I got a confirmation of that only yesterday. It ought to be signed into law by tonight. Batman nodded. I think there's still time to do something. I'm glad you let me have the facsimile plans for your production models. I'll have a chance to study them on the plane to Washington. My competition would do a lot to get their hands on those blueprints. Don't worry. I'll destroy them when I'm finished with them. Now, these people who took over your company, you really have no idea who is in control of them? Not at all. Whoever it is, they seem to have some friends in high places. I've never seen a contract go through so smoothly. One more question. Do any of your weapon systems make use of hallucinogens? Murphy looked surprised. How did you know? That's the, that's the tightest secret of the century. I learned it from a man with green hair, Batman said. Uh, come again? 
Forget I said it. Goodbye, Murphy. Good luck, Batman. Thanks. I suspect I'm going to need it. Batman drove another five miles down the highway. No cars passed him in either direction. That was just as well. Your average cowboy might become curious if he passed a new red pickup driven by a man over six feet tall dressed as a bat. Not that that was likely. Batman had taken the precaution of spraying the windshield and windows of the pickup with a glare-resistant compound that did not impede vision from inside the vehicle but rendered it opaque from the outside. He had neglected to tell Murphy that the compound washed off with soap and water. An uncustomary lapse, but no doubt Murphy could figure that out for himself. Batman stopped the pickup on a turnout and quickly changed to the sober and well-tailored suit of Charlie Morrison. He packed up the Batman gear and the folding valise that he'd brought along for that purpose and went on to the airport. Bruce decided not to take a commercial aircraft, since none were scheduled at a suitable hour. He quickly arranged to charter a plane for the trip to Washington. Although he was an experienced pilot, he also hired a pilot. It was simply easier that way. The Batman gear, the two suitcases of special equipment, and the utility belt fit nicely into the Learjet he had rented. He had time for a quick brunch while the pilot fueled up and made out a flight plan. He had a small green salad and a side dish of guacamole, accompanied by plenty of strong black coffee. He had just paid his bill when he remembered a phone call that he had to make. He telephoned Commissioner James Gordon in Gotham City and told him briefly where he was going. That was necessary in case anything happened to him. If Robin could be killed, then Batman could be killed. But crime fighting had to go on. Then he went to the personal services booth and arranged for a chauffeur to take Red Murphy's pickup to where he was waiting, reading a newspaper under the cottonwoods. And then it was plain time. It was early evening when the quick little Learjet flew into Washington's Reagan Airport. The evening lights were on in the city, twinkling little fairy lights belying the skullduggery that went on in the nation's capital. In the airport, taking a private booth in the first-class lounge's men's room, Bruce dressed again in the Batman outfit. This time, he left off the mask and cowl, concealing his costume under a long camel's hair overcoat. He was going to need both of his identities if he hoped to get this job done. When he emerged, he looked like any well-dressed young man. The overcoat was loose enough to conceal the bulky utility belt. It was difficult to know in advance exactly which piece of equipment he would need. He caught a taxi into Washington proper, directing the driver to take him to Old Edward's Chop House on 5th in Ohio. It was a popular dining place for Washingtonians. It was also just across the street from the Gaudy Building, where, in the general procurement offices of the 40th floor, the contracts for the ARDC were to be signed. The Gaudy Building was not a simple glass tower like so much of the recent construction in Washington. It had been done in a florid, neo-baroque style, with pediments and gargoyles and odd curves and unexpected angles. The architect, Nino de Talaveras of Barcelona, the eccentric Spanish mystic who had won the Prix de Rome for architecture two years running, had predicted, accurately as it turned out, that the Gaudi building would introduce a new and popular style into the sterile skyline of the nation's capital. This unique and unexpected building was liked by many. Batman was not one of them. Batman's judgment was not aesthetic, however. It was purely functional. He had worked out long ago a system and the necessary equipment to scale glass towers with great speed and sureness. Now, Faced with a brand new version of an outmoded architectural schema, he saw that he would have to improvise. The porous Carrara granite offered unreliable purchase for the quick-release suction cups that he usually relied on. The laser glass cutters he had used so often to gain entry through the gigantic picturesque windows would do no good with windows shaped like slits and barred with wrought iron bars. He sighed. It was hard enough staying up with new technology without having to reinvent ways of scaling ancient buildings. He could try to get in through one of the entrances, of course. The thought was attractive, but impractical. He decided after giving it a moment's thought. There was an unusual flurry of activity around the building tonight. The streets were full of police SWAT teams. 
There were also a lot of men lurking around in simple seersucker suits and rep ties with bulges in their jackets. These, Batman knew from previous experience, were apt to be Secret Service men. Had Murphy talked to the people who had such a hold over him? Had he given Batman away? Batman thought not, but they might have become curious about Murphy's unusual actions of the night before, firing off his 44 Magnum and then, in the morning, driving out in his pickup. They would have to be extremely obtuse not to relate these discrepancies. Would they have time to do anything about them? He would have to wait and see. Batman had had a chance to study ARDC's plans on the trip to Washington, concealing them within a newspaper so that the pilot, a cheerful Tennessean named Cohen, would not get curious. Bruce Wayne had a fair technical background. He augmented it with a great deal of mathematical and scientific reading. He was able to supplement his insights now by using his laptop computer, built to his own specifications at high cost but with the power of a third-generation mainframe. The insights he had gained into the blueprints had been eye-opening, to say the least. If that contract were signed into law… He studied the building again. Getting into it was never going to get much easier than it was right now. He finished his meal at the chop house, paid his bill, went to the restroom, and slipped out the back way. He was in a noisome alley. Yowling cats slunk around overflowing garbage cans. The zebra-like combination of strong lights and impenetrable shadows made the perfect mellow for a man on the run, or a bat in flight. Within the gaudy building, on the 40th floor, in a special amphitheater with recessed lighting, the Joint Chiefs were meeting to consider the ARDC contract proposals. Admiral William Fenton was chairman for tonight's session. He was a square-faced old sea dog with iron-gray hair and a bulldog mouth. General Flying Phil Kowalski, Commandant of the Air Force, sat at his right hand. Kowalski was tall and slim. His baby face tussled blonde hair and easy laughter belied the fact that he'd been an ace during the recent incident in the South Caribbean, piloting his own Thunderclap-class all-weather interceptor and shooting down four Trinidadian jets before it was discovered that the U.S. was not at war with Trinidad. Beside him was General Chuck Rohart of the Army, a short, heavily built body displaying the concentrated attentiveness that a really good tank commander needs. Well, Admiral Fenton said, we might as well call this meeting to order. I propose that we waive the reading of the minutes of the last meeting. There are entirely too many important decisions to make tonight without having to rehash any old ones. No objections? Good. Let's go on. I believe that General Kowalski has a somewhat unusual request to make. Flying Phil stood up, grinning pleasantly, twirling his gold-leaf-encrusted hat in his hands in an awkward motion that he had studied with some care. As I understand it, this meeting is to decide the issue of the ARDC contract ducket number 123341-A-2. That is correct, Admiral Fenton said. As you would know, if you had attended yesterday's meeting, those of us present weighed the pros and cons of the new ARDC system. Since we will be supplying these weapons to our own troops as well as our allies, I need hardly mention to you the seriousness of this contract. I know the weapons are good said General Rohort, shifting his heavy body in an alert manner. But can ARDC be relied upon to deliver? I think we need have no doubts about that, Fenton said. But as a final witness, I have taken the liberty of calling in James Nelson, Deputy Director of the CIA. Fenton gestured, and a yeoman opened the door to the outer office. In walked a tall, tan man dressed entirely in shades of tan. Even his fingernails were tan, an extremely light tan, but a tan nonetheless. Only his teeth were white, his teeth and the whites of his eyes. General Kowalski wondered if it meant anything that the first thing he noticed about James Nelson was the whites of his eyes. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' Nelson said. 
Please excuse my tan. I'm just back from Florida where I have been supervising our counterinsurgency program designed to bring Colombian cocaine dealers in line with current clandestine drug pricing policies. Have they been undercutting the government drug supply program again? General Rohort said, a frown on his tank-like face. Indeed they have, Nelson said. The loss of revenue for the government's various clandestine services has been severe, and of course there is the loss of quality experienced by the end users. That foreign stuff doesn't meet FDA regulations, Admiral Fenton growled. There really ought to be a law against it. The president believes in free trade, Nelson said. Within limits, of course. He ignored the no-smoking sign and lit a cigarette. The faint yellow cast of the tan cigarette contrasted subtly with the faded rose tan of his lips. "'Well, never mind,' Kowalski said. "'It's none of our business what anybody does about drugs. We're here to do something about this contract. I must say, Nelson, I've had my doubts about a few of the details.' "'Set your mind to rest,' Nelson said. This is one of the best and most constructive contracts the U.S. government has ever entered into with a company from the private sector. What makes it even nicer is that several of our foreign allies will also profit from the contract and give this move a lot of good publicity. A copy of the contract was taken out and passed around. The Joint Chiefs peered at it and passed it around. Well, gee, Kowalski said, I'm still unsure. Let me reassure you, Nelson said. The president himself wants this bill to be signed into law. Then why doesn't he tell us so? Kowalski asked. Uh, gentlemen, th that is just what he is going to do. The president is coming here to witness your signatures and congratulate you on doing your patriotic duty. The president coming here, said Chuck Rohort. You got it, Chuck, Fenton said. Then let me waste no further time, Nelson said. Gentlemen, the president. He nodded to the almond. The almond gulped and opened the door. In walked Marshal Selden, the tall, stooped, gray-haired man with the lopsided grin known in every home around America. The Joint Chiefs rose so as to crowd around the President. Nelson made them stay back. The President held up a hand. Soon they heard his familiar Tweedy tenor. Gentlemen, I have many important matters to attend to. Please sign the treaty and let us get on with the business of confounding our enemies and comforting our friends. The Joint Chiefs crowded around, each pushing to be first. They were interrupted by a clear baritone voice as the door opened again, this time without any assistance from the Yaman. Before you sign that piece of paper, gentlemen, I'd like a word with you. They all fell silent. Even important men like generals and admirals were likely to give Batman a chance to speak. Nelson was an exception to that rule by virtue of his unique position. It was his duty not to be seduced by other men's words. He knew that Batman did not belong there. He pretended to listen, but all the time his right hand was snaking toward his belt, where a two-shot Derringer, disguised as a Hickok belt buckle, awaited his touch. Batman had no insurmountable difficulties scaling the gaudy at first. He hadn't been able to use the means that had gotten him over the ARDC fence. In that instance, he had employed a whiz-bang, a simple enough contraption designed to make brilliant flashes of light and strange, unsettling noises, and to do so long enough to allow an attack to be launched from another quarter. The attacker had been Batman himself, climbing up and over the fence, protected from the electrical current by his insulated gloves and boots. For a moment, he had blotted out the stars as he came over the fence and down the other side. During that brief time, Billy Joe and Steve were blinking into the flash of the whiz-bang, blinded and deafened for critical moments necessary for Batman to land safely and secretly on the other side. No such diversion could be used here. No distraction could be counted on to rivet the attention for the long minutes that would be needed to scale the gaudy, and nothing in Batman's bag of tricks could propel him to the 40th floor. Luckily, there was a brilliant gibbous moon that night. It bathed one face of the building in its cold white light, but left the other faces in darkness. Using spring-driven crampons of his own devising that permitted him to get footholds on granite, the masked man swarmed up the dark side of the building. When he reached the fifth floor, where there was a row of gargoyles, an expedient presented itself. The next level of gargoyles was on the tenth floor, and each five floors after that. The Batarang presented a feasible opportunity, tied to a light line on the end of a coiled line. Batman was an expert at throwing the curiously shaped Batarang. 
similar to a boomerang but infinitely more useful in terms of angles that it could be projected along. Batman's first cast was a few feet high. He retrieved the batarang and threw again, cautioning himself not to overdo it. Precision was called for, not brute strength. This time, the batarang flew true and coiled around the neck of a stone devil. To climb 40 stories up a rope is, in its quiet way, a greater feat than many others the world deems more spectacular. Luckily, Batman had along a bat hoist to assist him on vertical ascents by rope. The little device, powered by a miniature atomic motor and operating through a cunning set of gears, was able to pull a man's weight up a rope at a steady four miles an hour. When Batman gained the 40th floor, he used a handheld punch to take out the exterior window fasteners and let himself in. He took care not to drop the window and refastened the fasteners again from the inside, reversing the handheld punch and tapping the rivets in with great delicacy. After that, it was easy enough to skulk down the hall and find the main conference room where the Joint Chiefs were meeting. "'What's the meaning of this?' Admiral Fenton said. "'I've heard of you, of course, Batman. It's said that you serve some good causes, but if you think your reputation is going to intimidate me, you've got another thing coming.' I had no such thought. I merely wanted to present a few facts about the ARDC weapon systems with which you are proposing to arm our forces. "'You've got a lot of nerve!' Fenton said, trying to teach us our business. We've checked out those weapons to the hundredth decimal point. They are the best I've ever seen. Perhaps, but have you also checked out their computer-supported operating systems? It's a new system, General Rohort said, it's supposed to be the best the mind of man has come up with. I'd advise you to look again, Batman said. I have some documents I think you'll find interesting. What are you getting at, Batman? Fenton said. You don't expect to stop us, do you?" The masked man did not answer. "'This place is filled with our men,' Fenton went on. "'You can't hope to delay us from signing for long, and to think you'd try something like this with the President here?' President Marshal Selden had been standing at the far end of the room throughout this exchange. Now, smiling slightly, he said, "'Let him show us his documents. This will be amusing.' Batman pulled his cloak close to him, and from a pocket deep in its fold, he extracted a wad of computer printouts. They showed complex circuitry and were filled with tiny numbers and Greek letters. Gentlemen, please take a look at these. Kowalski was the first to reach for one. What are these? Schematics for the main computer circuitry for the ARDC weapons. Kowalski looked through them, his curly blonde hair tumbling boyishly over his forehead. Yes, yes, it all looks all right so far. Yes, that's a standard slagger circuit, but uh, what's this? It's tied into a, a resonator with a provision for a switchable mirror reflectivity? Hell, I see what you mean. What is that? The other chiefs asked, not being as adept at computer schematics as was the tall young Air Force general. Kowalski looked up, and his face was grim. You tell them, Batman. I believe you've all heard of computer viruses. Of course, Fenton said. They're those specially designed programs that some madman or malcontents devise to feed into computers and so render them inoperative, sometimes for long periods of time until a killer program can be devised and introduced to get rid of them again. Sometimes the computer virus program is so deeply ingrained that even the metals of the affected computers must be changed due to imprinting error. But nobody is going to introduce any viruses into these programs, Batman. This is a whole new generation of program. It is virus-resistant, except to an as-yet-undevised new generation of computer viruses." That is true. But you missed the point. Which is? The software for the ARDC program is designed to generate its own virus, which will first pervert its functioning, then destroy it. Create its own viruses? General Rohort said, like tadpoles hatching out of mud? Kowalski nodded grimly. It's there in the specs, General. We just overlooked it, as we were intended to do. Rohort turned to Kowalski. You understand these matters, Flying Phil, but I can hardly believe it. Can what the masked man is saying be true? It's true, all right, Kowalski said, a note of iron underlying the lightness of his voice. That's exactly what it is. Gentlemen, 
It was the voice of President Selden, and it brought every man in the room to attention, and the Yalman too. Yes, Mr. President, said Admiral Fenton. First of all, I want to thank Batman, the President said, for having brought this matter to our attention. As a matter of fact, we've already corrected the design flaw, Batman, and now there is nothing standing in the way of the Joint Chiefs signing it. That document must not be signed, Batman said, and these men must no longer take their orders from you. Why do you say that? The President asked. Stop this senseless charade now, Batman, and I think we can arrange a medal for you. How would you like an official position in my cabinet? Presidential advisor on superheroes, how does that sound to you? It's fine, Mr. President, except for one thing. He stepped forward suddenly, walking directly toward the President. Even Nelson of the CIA was caught off guard for a moment. He drew his sidearm quickly, not the belt buckle Derringer, but a heavy Browning automatic that he reserved for dire emergencies. But by then, Batman had stepped up to the President. And then, in another step, he had walked through the President. And the President continued smiling. The Joint Chiefs stared at Batman, slack-jawed. Nelson stood with the gun at his side, momentarily frozen. The trouble is, I don't see how you can do anything, Mr. President, because you are not the President at all. What in God's name is it? Fenton asked. Long suppressed superstition bringing his voice to a reedy tenor. A ghost? Not exactly. It's a hologram. Fenton was trying to understand. How did you know? Because the same people who produce this, Batman said, jerking a gloved thumb at the still smiling hologram of President Selden, have also been throwing holograms of other people. Who are these people? Kowalski asked. I think that Deputy Director James Nelson here has the answer to that one. Nelson looked at him with pure hate. The image of the President winked out abruptly. Deputy Director Nelson had come into prominence about six months before, when James Tolliver, respected head of the CIA, had fallen ill to an as-yet-unidentified virus that even the best specialists had been unable to cure. The disease had taken a great toll on Tolliver's strength and vitality. Bedridden, kept alive on support systems, Tolliver had been forced to turn over the day-to-day -day running of the agency to his assistant, Nelson. Nelson was known as an extremely capable man with a grandiose personality. He had a reputation for ruthlessness and, more recently, an almost paranoid self-assurance. He'd been known to take the law into his own hands when he thought he knew what to do better than his superiors. This Tolliver would not tolerate. There had been rumors that Tolliver had been planning to fire Nelson or force him into early retirement but now Tolliver was able to do nothing but lie in an oxygen tent and fight for his life. Some in Washington circles considered Nelson more than a little dangerous, and more than a little crazy. Like many other crazy and dangerous men, he had gathered a small circle of CIA operatives around him, whom he had seduced to his view. They were fanatical in their devotion to him. They would follow his every order. These were the men who came into the meeting room now, moving slowly and alertly, hands near their concealed weapons. That contract is going to be signed, Nelson said. You must be mad, Admiral Fenton said. You can't expect us to sign it after all this. I can, and you shall, but you needn't bother doing it in person, gentlemen. I have expert forgers who can do a better job of your signatures than you can do yourselves. What are you going to do with us? Rohort asked. You'll be given heroes burials, Nelson said. We've already established that Batman's been having hallucinations. His misadventures with Alona and others in the New Era Hotel are on film. The public will believe it when we tell them that he massacred all of you before we could get here and kill him. We will release our news shortly before Super Bowl time, when no one will pay it any attention anyhow. And what about me? Batman asked. Nelson gave a short, unhappy laugh. 
<laughs> I tried my best to keep you out of this, Batman. I decided to work on you. With the aid of my organization, I discovered your true identity. You are Charlie Morrison." The tall, hooded figure stirred slightly. A smile appeared on the masked man's grim lips. "'Is that why you showed those holograms to Charlie Morrison in the New Era Hotel?' Batman asked. "'I was trying to convince you to stay out of this.' "'Your sense of psychology is as flawed as your sense of strategy. How could Batman resist a challenge like that? You set up your own defeat, Nelson.' "'But, Nelson, why are you doing this?' General Kowalski asked. "'Why do you want us to sign the contract? The ARDC weapon system is obviously flawed, and it's vulnerable to infiltration by enemy computers. As soon as our enemies get wind of this, they can attack our weapons systems with impunity. When we try to fight back, our own weapons will be programmed to act against us.' "'That's what Tolliver said when I showed him the plan,' Nelson said. He couldn't see that its weakness was only the outer layer of a deeper scheme. Yes, our enemies will certainly learn about the deficiencies in our plans and try to make a profit from our weakness. But we also have another program, this one really secret, which turns our enemies' apparent gain into our advantage. It's a built-in computer-killing program that is initiated when they try to crack our codes. When our enemies try to stab us in the back by reprogramming our weapon systems, they'll find they've introduced the seeds of destruction into their own systems." Interesting, Batman said. Alona was a plant, I suppose. Of course, Nelson said. We faked her death. The Joint Chiefs looked at each other in astonishment. Finally, Fenton said, Nelson, this whole thing's crazy. Your plan is crazy. What if our enemies also discover the scavenger program? We have other secrets, Nelson cried. His eyes were quite mad. You don't know how many secrets we have. Only my followers and I are aware of the power we can wield and the influence we can have upon events. Batman said, What I do know is you and your little clique stand to make a lot of money out of this contract. You are the secret shareholder behind the buyout of ARDC. Isn't that so? Nelson shrugged. <laughs> it doesn't matter that you know that now. There's nothing you can do about it. This contract is going through. Oh, I don't think so. James Nelson looked at the hooded figure and laughed. <laughs> are you going to stop us? According to the standard biographical material, you are vulnerable to human weapons, unlike your hard-shelled friend Superman. I puncture as easily as other men. But first, you have to hit me. Nelson raised his gun. Batman opened his hand. A flock of tiny motes flew out of the capsule at the end of his little finger, which he had managed to puncture while Nelson was ranting. The motes flew toward the light sources. The lights flashed, crazily dimmed, and went black. "'Chinese light suckers!' Nelson exclaimed. "'You are a clever Batman, but it will do you no good. Shoot, man!' The CIA men swung into action. Shots crashed through the room, ricocheting off filing cabinets, screaming off the hardened plastic walls like a swarm of enraged hornets. But Batman was already moving, an inky shadow in the darkened room. The Joint Chiefs, too, had dived under tables and were answering the CIA fire with their own sidearms. The outcome was never really in doubt, but perhaps it was just as well that James Gordon, at the head of the platoon of New Gotham's finest, burst through the doors just then. The hard-bitten boys in blue made short work of the seersuckered government operatives. Gordon, Batman said, what are you doing here? After you called me, I figured you might need a little bit backup, Gordon said. So I brought a platoon of my Gotham City boys for a tour of Washington. Don't kill Nelson, Batman said. The rat deserves it, Gordon said, but held his fire. I know he does, but he has to take us to wherever he's hidden the president. Nelson, in handcuffs, led them to a small storage room in the basement. There, haggard and unshaven, they found President Marshal Selden. Batman, Selden said, I might have guessed it'd be you. I thought I'd taken care of you, Batman, Nelson said. I seem to have been mistaken. The tan man bit down hard and grimaced, then slumped to the floor. The acrid odor of bitter almonds filled the room. A cyanide capsule. Poor deluded fool. It's all over now, Mr. President, Batman said but I think you're going to need a new deputy director.
Back at his house in Gotham City, Bruce Wayne was reading the newspaper in the drawing room when Alfred came in with a letter on a silver tray. For you, sir, from Miss Vera. Bruce opened it and scanned it quickly. She says she's having a wonderful time, he said, but misses me and wishes I would join her. A very good idea, sir, Alfred said from the door. Bruce Wayne needed less than a second to consider and make up his mind. Alfred, pack my tropicals and book me the next flight to Rio. Very good, sir, the butler said, smiling despite his best efforts to maintain a grave face. And the overnight suit, sir? Don't pack it. This time I'm really going to take a vacation. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others, as well as help for other issues, such as domestic abuse, sex trafficking, crisis pregnancy, and more. Even help if you're struggling to get past a paranormal event that has happened to you. That's the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. While there, you can also click on Tell Your Story to share your own paranormal or creepy tale. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The fictional Batman story, Death of the Dream Master, was written by Robert Sheckley and it can be found in the anthology novel The Further Adventures of Batman, 14 All-New Adventures of the Caped Crusader, which I have linked to in the episode description. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Something special for this Batman episode. Isaiah 1 verse 17. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. And a final thought. Our greatest glory is not in ever falling, but in rising every time we fall. Attributed to many authors, including Nelson Mandela, Confucius, and Batman. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.